Chapter 42 One day Martin became aware that he was lonely. He was healthy and strong, and had nothing to do. The cessation from writing and studying, the death of Brissenden, and the estrangement from Ruth had made a big hole in his life, and his life refused to be pinned down to good living in cafés and the smoking of Egyptian cigarettes. It was true the South Seas were calling to him, but he had a feeling that the game was not yet played out in the United States. Two books were soon to be published, and he had more books that might find publication. Money could be made out of them, and he would wait and take a sack full of it into the South Seas. He knew a valley and a bay in the Marquesas that he could buy for a thousand chili dollars. The valley ran from the horseshoe, landlocked bay to the tops of the dizzy, cloud-capped peaks, and contained perhaps ten thousand acres. It was filled with tropical fruits, wild chickens, and wild pigs, with an occasional herd of wild cattle, while high up among the peaks were herds of wild goats, harried by packs of wild dogs. The whole place was wild. Not a human lived in it, and he could buy it and the bay for a thousand chilly dollars. The bay, as he remembered it, was magnificent, with water deep enough to accommodate the largest vessel afloat, and so safe that the South Pacific Directory recommended it as the best careening place for ships for hundreds of miles around. He would buy a schooner, one of those yacht-like, coppered crafts that sailed like witches, and go trading copra and purling among the islands. He would make the valley and the bay his headquarters. He would build a patriarchal grass house like Tati's, and have it and the valley and the schooner filled with dark-skinned servitors. He would entertain there the factor of Tahoe, captains of wandering traders, and all the best of the South Pacific riffraff. He would keep open house and entertain like a prince. And he would forget the books he had opened and the world that had proved an illusion. To do all this he must wait in California and fill the sack with money. Already it was beginning to flow in. If one of the books made a strike, it might enable him to sell the whole heap of manuscripts. Also, he could collect the stories and poems into books and make sure of the valley and the bay and the schooner. He would never write again. Upon that he was resolved, but in the meantime, awaiting the publication of the books, he must do something more than live dazed and stupid in the sort of uncaring trance into which he had fallen. He noted, one Sunday morning, that the bricklayer's picnic took place that day at Shell Mound Park, and to Shell Mound Park he went. He had been to the working-class picnics too often in his earlier life not to know what they were like and as he entered the park he experienced a recrudescence of all the old sensations. After all, they were his kind, these working people. He had been born among them, he had lived among them, and though he had strayed for a time, it was well to come back among them. If it ain't Mart, he heard someone say, and the next moment a hearty hand was on his shoulder. Where you been all the time, off to sea? Come and have a drink. It was the old crowd in which he found himself, the old crowd with here and there a gap, and here and there a new face. The fellows were not bricklayers, but, as in the old days, they attended all the Sunday picnics for the dancing, and the fighting, and the fun. Martin drank with them, and began to feel really human once more. He was a fool to have ever left them, he thought and he was very certain that the sum of happiness would have been greater had he remained with them, and let alone the books and the people who sat in high places. Yet the beer seemed not so good as of yore. It didn't taste as it used to taste. Brissenden had spoiled him for steam beer, he concluded, and wondered if, after all, the books had spoiled him for companionship with these friends of his youth. He resolved that he would not be so spoiled, and he went on to the dancing pavilion. Jimmy, the plumber, he met there, in the company of a tall, blonde girl, who promptly forsook him for Martin. 
Gee, it's like old times. Jimmy explained to the gang that gave him the laugh as Martin and the blonde whirled away in a waltz. And I don't give a rap. I'm too damn glad to see him back. Watch him waltz, eh? It's like silk. Who'd blame any girl? But Martin restored the blonde to Jimmy, and the three of them, with half a dozen friends, watched the revolving couples and laughed and joked with one another. Everybody was glad to see Martin back. No book of his had been published. He carried no fictitious value in their eyes. They liked him for himself. He felt like a prince returned from exile, and his lonely heart burgeoned in the geniality in which it bathed. He made a mad day of it, and was at his best. Also, he had money in his pockets, and, as in the old days when he returned from sea with a payday, he made the money fly. Once, on the dance floor, he saw Lizzie Connolly go by, in the arms of a young working man. And later, when he had made the round of the pavilion, he came upon her sitting by a refreshment table. Surprise and greetings over, he led her away into the grounds, where they could talk without shouting down the music. From the instant he spoke to her, she was his. He knew it. She showed it in the proud humility of her eyes, in every caressing movement of her proudly carried body, and in the way she hung on his speech. She was not the young girl as he had known her. She was a woman now, and Martin noted that her wild, defiant beauty had improved, losing none of its wildness, while the defiance and the fire seemed more in control. A beauty, a perfect beauty, he murmured admiringly under his breath, and he knew she was his, and all he had to do was to say, Come, and she would go with him over the world wherever he led. Even as the thought flashed through his brain, he received a heavy blow on the side of his head that nearly knocked him down. It was a man's fist, directed by a man so angry and in such haste that the fist had missed the jaw for which it was aimed. Martin turned as he staggered and saw the fist coming at him in a wild swing. Quite as a matter of course, he ducked, and the fist flew harmlessly past pivoting the man who had driven it. Martin hooked with his left, landing on the pivoting man with the weight of his body behind the blow. The man went to the ground sidewise, leaped to his feet, and made a mad rush. Martin saw his passion-distorted face and wondered what could be the cause of the fellow's anger. But while he wondered, he shot in a straight left the weight of his body behind the blow. The man went over backward and fell in a crumpled heap. Jimmy and the others of the gang were running toward him. Martin was thrilling all over. This was the old days with a vengeance, with their dancing and their fighting and their fun. While he kept a wary eye on his antagonist, he glanced at Lizzie. Usually the girl screamed when the fellows got to scrapping, but she had not screamed. She was looking on with bated breath leaning slightly forward. So keen was her interest, one hand pressed to her breast, her cheek flushed, and in her eyes a great and amazed admiration. The man had gained his feet, and was struggling to escape the restraining arms that were laid on him. "'She was waiting for me to come back,' he was proclaiming to all and sundry. "'She was waiting for me to come back, and then that fresh guy comes butting in. Let go of me, I tell you.' I'm going to fix him. What's eatin' yer? Jimmy was demanding, as he helped hold the young fellow back. That guy's Mart Eden. He's nifty with his mitts, let me tell you that, and he'll eat you alive if you monkey with him. He can't steal her on me that way, the other interjected. He licked the flying Dutchman, and you know him, Jimmy went on expostulating, and he did it in five rounds. You couldn't last a minute against him, see? This information seemed to have a mollifying effect, and the irate young man favored Martin with a measuring stare. He don't look it, he sneered, but the sneer was without passion. That's what the flying Dutchman thought, Jimmy assured him. Come on now, let's get out of this. There's lots of other girls. Come on. 
The young fellow allowed himself to be led away toward the pavilion, and the gang followed after him. "'Who is he?' Martin asked Lizzie. "'And what's it all about, anyway?' Already the zest of combat, which of old had been so keen and lasting, had died down, and he discovered that he was self-analytical, too much so to live, single heart and single hand, so primitive an existence. Lizzie tossed her head. "'Oh, he's nobody,' she said. "'He's just been keeping company with me.' "'I had to, you see,' she explained after a pause. "'I was getting pretty lonesome, but I never forgot.' Her voice sank lower, and she looked straight before him. "'I'd throw him down for you any time.' Martin, looking at her averted face, knowing that all he had to do was to reach out his hand and pluck her, fell to pondering whether— after all, there was any real worth in refined, grammatical English, and so forgot to reply to her. "'You put it all over him,' she said tentatively, with a laugh. "'He's a husky young fellow, though,' he admitted generously. "'If they hadn't taken him away, he might have given me my hands full.' "'Who was that lady friend I saw you with that night?' she asked abruptly. "'Oh, just a lady friend,' was the answer." It was a long time ago, she murmured contemplatively. It seems like a thousand years. But Martin went no farther in the matter. He led the conversation off into other channels. They had lunch in the restaurant, where he ordered wine and expensive delicacies, and afterward he danced with her, and with no one but her, till she was tired. He was a good dancer, and she whirled around and around with him in a heaven of delight her head against his shoulder, wishing that it could last forever. Later in the afternoon they strayed off among the trees, where, in the good old fashion, she sat down while he sprawled on his back, his head in her lap. He lay and dozed while she fondled his hair, looked down on his closed eyes, and loved him without reserve. Looking up suddenly, he read the tender advertisement in her face. Her eyes fluttered down, then they opened and looked into his with soft defiance. "'I've kept straight all these years,' she said, her voice so low that it was almost a whisper. In his heart Martin knew that it was the miraculous truth, and at his heart pleaded a great temptation. It was in his power to make her happy. Denied happiness himself, why should he deny happiness to her? He could marry her, and take her down with him to dwell in the grass-walled castle in the Marquesas. The desire to do it was strong, but stronger still was the imperative command of his nature not to do it. In spite of himself, he was still faithful to love. The old days of license and easy living were gone. He could not bring them back, nor could he go back to them. He was changed. How changed, he had not realized until now. "'I am not a marrying man, Lizzie,' he said lightly. The hand caressing his hair paused perceptibly, then went on with the same gentle stroke. He noticed her face harden, but it was with the hardness of resolution, for still the soft color was in her cheeks, and she was all glowing and melting. "'I did not mean that,' she began, then faltered. "'Or, anyway, I don't care.' "'I don't care.' she repeated. I'm proud to be your friend. I'd do anything for you. I'm made that way, I guess. Martin sat up. He took her hand in his. He did it deliberately, with warmth, but without passion. And such warmth chilled her. Don't let's talk about it, she said. You are a great and noble woman, he said. And it is I who should be proud to know you. And I am, I am. You are a ray of light to me in a very dark world, and I've got to be straight with you, just as straight as you have been. I don't care whether you're straight or not. You could do anything with me. You could throw me in the dirt and walk on me. And you're the only man in the world that can, she added with a defiant flash. I ain't taken care of myself since I was a kid for nothing. And it's just because of that that I'm not going to, he said gently. 
You are so big and generous that you challenge me to equal generousness. I'm not marrying, and I'm not, well, loving without marrying, though I've done my share of that in the past. I'm sorry I came here today and met you, but it can't be helped now, and I never expected it would turn out this way. But look here, Lizzie, I can't begin to tell you how much I like you. I do more than like you. I admire and respect you. You are magnificent, and you are magnificently good. But what's the use of words? Yet there's something I'd like to do. You've had a hard life. Let me make it easy for you. A joyous light welled into her eyes, then faded out again. I'm pretty sure of getting hold of some money soon. Lots of it. In that moment he abandoned the idea of the valley and the bay, the grass-walled castle and the trim white schooner. After all, what did it matter? He could go away, as he had done so often, before the mast, on any ship bound anywhere. I'd like to turn it over to you. There must be something you want, to go to school or business college. You might like to study and be a stenographer. I could fix it for you. Or maybe your father and mother are living. I could set them up in a grocery store or something. Anything you want, just name it, and I can fix it up for you. She made no reply, but sat, gazing straight before her, dry-eyed and motionless, but with an ache in the throat, which Martin divined so strongly that it made his own throat ache. He regretted that he had spoken. It seemed so tawdry what he had offered her. Mere money, compared with what she offered him. He offered her an extraneous thing with which he could part without a pang, while she offered him herself along with disgrace and shame and sin, and all her hopes of heaven. "'Don't let's talk about it,' she said with a catch in her voice that she changed to a cough. She stood up. "'Come on, let's go home. I'm all tired out.' The day was done, and the merrymakers had nearly all departed. But as Martin and Lizzie emerged from the trees, they found the gang waiting for them. Martin knew immediately the meaning of it, trouble was brewing. The gang was his bodyguard. They passed out through the gates of the park with, straggling in the rear, a second gang, the friends that Lizzie's young man had collected to avenge the loss of his lady. Several constables and special police officers, anticipating trouble, trailed along to prevent it, and herded the two gangs separately aboard the train for San Francisco. Martin told Jimmy that he would get off at 16th Street Station and catch the electric car into Oakland. Lizzie was very quiet and without interest in what was impending. The train pulled into 16th Street Station, and the waiting electric car could be seen, the conductor of which was impatiently clanging the gong. "'There she is,' Jimmy counseled. "'Make a run for it, and we'll hold him back. Now you go. Hit her up.' The hostile gang was temporarily disconcerted by the maneuver. Then it dashed from the train in pursuit. The staid and sober Oakland folk, who waited upon the car, scarcely noted the young fellow and the girl who ran for it, and found a seat in front on the outside. They did not connect the couple with Jimmy, who sprang on the steps, crying to the motorman, "'Slam on the juice, old man, and beat it out of here!' The next moment Jimmy whirled about, and the passengers saw him land his fists on the face of a running man who was trying to board the car. But fists were landing on faces the whole length of the car. Thus, Jimmy and his gang, strung out on the long lower steps, met the attacking gang. The car started with a great clanging of its gong, and, as Jimmy's gang drove off the last assailants, they too jumped off to finish the job. The car dashed on, leaving the flurry of combat far behind, and its dumbfounded passengers never dreamed that the quiet young man and the pretty working-class girl sitting in the corner on the outside seat had been the cause of the row. Martin had enjoyed the fight, with a recrudescence of the old fighting thrills, but they quickly died away, and he was oppressed by a great sadness. He felt very old centuries older than those careless, carefree young companions of his other days. 
he had traveled far, too far to go back. Their mode of life, which had once been his, was now distasteful to him. He was disappointed in it all. He had developed into an alien. As the steam beer had tasted raw, so their companionship seemed raw to him. He was too far removed. Too many thousands of opened books yawned between him and them. He had exiled himself. He had traveled in the vast realm of intellect until he could no longer return home. On the other hand, he was human, and his gregarious need for companionship remained unsatisfied. He had found no new home. As the gang could not understand him, as his own family could not understand him, as the bourgeoisie could not understand him, so this girl beside him, whom he honored high, could not understand him, nor the honor he paid her. His sadness was not untouched with bitterness as he thought it over. Make it up with him, he advised Lizzie at parting, as they stood in front of the working man's shack in which she lived, near Sixth and Market. He referred to the young fellow whose place he had usurped that day. I can't now, she said. Oh, go on, he said jovially. All you have to do is whistle, and he'll come running. I didn't mean that, she said simply. And he knew what she had meant. She leaned toward him as he was about to say good night. But she leaned not imperatively nor seductively, but wistfully and humbly. He was touched to the heart. His large tolerance rose up in him. He put his arms around her and kissed her and knew that upon his own lips rested as true a kiss as man ever received. My God, she sobbed, I could die for you, I could die for you. She tore herself from him suddenly and ran up the steps. He felt a quick moisture in his eyes. Martin Eden, he communed, you're not a brute, and you're a damn poor Nietzsche man. You'd marry her if you could and fill her quivering heart full of happiness. But you can't, you can't, and it's a damn shame. A poor old tramp explains his poor old ulcers, he muttered, remembering his Henley. Life is, I think, a blunder and a shame. It is a blunder and a shame. End of chapter 42